Good afternoon, everyone. Chris here with Green Bar Trading, also known as Ghost of GBT on Reddit. I wanted to touch base with everybody. Uh, last week, I posted a thread on the uh, stock market forum that I wanted to do a live webinar with uh, the stock market group. And I was questioning what we should do it on. Originally, I was trying to just looking for a subject that we you know, could do this on. And um, I was planning on doing a live webinar, but it turned into sort of just a Q&A thread. And so what I'm going to end up doing is just uh, going through this thread and answering a bunch of the questions that people had posted. And then I will post it on YouTube just like I do with the weekly stock market picks. And then at the end of this, if we have time, um, depending on how long it goes, I will uh, share some of the stuff that I'm looking at for next week. Um, so if you don't know who I am, I do a weekly... Uh, technical analysis video for our stock market um, just to kind of give people an idea of like how I analyze charts and that type of thing. I'm a full-time trader uh, and um, this is what I do for a living. So I offered to basically answer a bunch of questions for people who had them and that's what we're going to do today. So what I'm going to do is just go through this and see if there's anything specific and then uh, maybe there'll be like some general subjects that we can talk about and we'll go from there. Um, So a bunch of people mentioned technical analysis, you know, would be a good start, but obviously that's going to be, that's more of a generic thing. So I'm looking for more specific questions. And so I'm going to go through those first and I'm sure it'll probably just kind of bleed into uh, the other stuff. <clears throat> uh, so this was an interesting question. Uh, this guy had asked, have you used price action much in your trading history? Uh, that's what I'm learning towards studying, and it just makes the most sense to me, just an idea. So I originally just said quickly, I use it every day. Is there anything specific that you're wondering about? And then he comes back and says, um, he's looking for aspects like candlestick setups, trend analysis, a lot of support and resistance, and said he was horrible at picking uh, stop losses and target prices. Um wanted to know if any of that relates to my experience. So I told him, and I'll go into a lot more detail about this, but I'm uh, about 80% technical trader. So I do use fundamental analysis, but I'm mostly a technical trader. So, you know, when I make decisions, I do it almost entirely based on the charts, right? So like NVIDIA the other day, um, you know, on Friday, they had their earnings release. You can see it made a nice run in pre-market here off of the 77 area. And then it consolidated into this nice, flag pattern here and then right out of the gate at 9 30 it took off you can see there was huge volume and we had a really nice run first thing in the morning so i actually bought this at 79 76 so like somewhere right in the in the middle of this flag right at the open um and uh, of course i always i always sell these things too soon but you know you got a really nice pop out of it first thing in the morning so this is a type of trader that i am i look for stuff that has a catalyst like earnings or um you know, FDA results or clinical trial results, something along those lines to kind of give the stock a reason to move. And then I'll look for patterns on the five minute or the one minute chart intraday in order to find a potential low risk trading opportunity, right? So there's one here as well. We had like sort of a morning consolidation and, you know, it coils up into this nice tight apex. And then you can see here, it stuck sort of right underneath $85. And these round numbers are always going to be a big thing, right? So $84.50, $85. And so what I'll do is just kind of look for a spot where I can get away with risking only, you know, 50 cents or a dollar per share for a potential three or four dollar per share upside gain. And that way, you know, no matter if I only win on 50% of my trades, right? If my wins are three or four times larger than my losses, then statistically speaking, I have to make money in the end. Um, so that's the type of trader that I am. And so, you know, the price action plays into that very, very important in, in, a, in a lot of ways. Um, so we'll get into, I guess, the more like the super specific questions, um, you know, about that in just a second. But just to address the question of price action, what I like to do is so there's there's basically like four or five types of price action that I look for. One of them is. Uh, trending, one of them is grinding, one of them is, uh, I'm just kind of doing these off the top of my head, um, churning, uh, spikes, 
and then uh, acceleration or deceleration. And then there's a fourth, or a, uh, I guess a one, two, three, four, five, a sixth sort of auxiliary one that I call holding. And so I'm gonna kind of go through what each one of these is just on a, on a high level. So if we look at a stock chart like NVIDIA, you'll see that there's certain charts, actually probably STEM is a better example from a couple of days ago. There's certain charts that just have a very clear up and down motion. And so this is what I mean by trending. So when we look at a stock that's trending, this is a certain type of price action, you know, that looks like this, right? It's either higher highs and higher lows, right? So higher high, higher high, higher high, higher low, higher low, higher low. That would be an uptrend. And then you have a downtrend, which would be the opposite, right? Lower highs and lower lows. But the point is, you know, that there's a pretty good size range uh, between these highs and lows. And so there's very clearly defined dips where you can buy the dip and sell on the pops. You know, so you buy these dips here. Uh, it obviously in a perfect world, you know, every stock would look like this, but they don't, right? I mean, stuff like this one was real clean, right? So you could get it at, it breaks through a dollar, comes back, bounces off of a dollar, right? So low of 102, bounces off a buck. After you've done this for a while, you'll see that these stocks will almost always bounce off of round numbers. And so, you know, for me, I knew that this was probably going to bounce off a of one. And so that's an easy place for me to rebuy it. Even if you bought it, you know, over here off of its initial breakout, you know, 85 cents or 83 cents, whatever it was, or even if you chased it a little bit and bought it up here like 95 where it broke out on the daily. So you had all of these highs over here from like the end of October that were around 95 cents. And so, you know, you could have bought it there as well. But the key is that once it dipped back, you have that round number sitting there, right? And so then you can buy it right above one and set your stop loss right underneath one. Um, and then also you have that daily support level at 95-ish, which would give you another potential spot for it to bounce off of just, you know, five cents below that. So you had a very low risk opportunity there to get into it. And so then over time, it starts to develop a trend and then you can just kind of follow the trend and buy every time it comes back to this trend line. So that's one type of price action that I look for is trending. This is obviously a nice, easy way to play and you can do this on any time frame. It doesn't necessarily have to be uh, a five minute time frame. It could be uh, a daily time frame. It could be a weekly time frame. It could be a monthly time frame if you're a longer term trader. Um, you know, so it doesn't have to be an intraday chart. It could be something that's more long term. <clears throat> so that's the first type of price action that I look for. The second type <clears throat> where in a trend, right, we have clear ups and downs. In another type of price action, you're going to have what's called uh, what I call just grinding up. Right. And so there's not really like a lot of clear dips to get in. You're just going to see a stock that's like, you know, grinding upwards or grinding downwards a few pennies at a time. Um, these are the stocks like, I don't know, Microsoft and Sprint, um, you know, real uh, high like high supply companies that have, you know, a lot of shares in the float and they're not, you know, they're very, very liquid. Those types of stocks tend to be more grindy. Um, and so depending on what type of price action I see, I'm going to treat the trade a little bit differently. So something like this with these, with, with a stock that's trending, it's very clear where you can sell into the pops, you know, because you know, sort of here's a dip and here's a, a, you know, a pop, here's a dip, here's a pop. And so it's obvious like where to buy and sell these with these types of stocks where it's just grinding. I usually just kind of size out along the way. Um, you know, just, I guess, you know, every 10 cents or every 20 cents, depending on the price of the stock, um, you know, maybe near round numbers or near major daily support and resistance levels, things like that. Um, you know, so it depends on the stock, obviously, but, you know, generally speaking, when there's a grind, I will just scale out of my position evenly along the way, whereas in a, uh, a trending stock, I'm going to wait until it approaches the upper trend line or the bottom trend line to buy and sell. Uh, what else we got? 
churning. Uh, so this is an interesting situation. Uh, what I notice is that you know, stocks don't tend to just go up straight up, right? They don't go straight up. They don't go straight down. When they do, that's usually an opportunity to, uh, you know, to make some money because they're going to revert to the mean. But <clears throat> more commonly, what happens is you're going to have something like what Nvidia did on Friday, where you have a, an initial sort of breakout, and then you have a consolidation where the stock the stock starts to churn sideways. Right, it's just rotating through people that are taking profits and other people that are buying the dips. Um, you know, it's just churning sideways, right? There's no real opportunity in here to make a lot of money, but what there is an opportunity to do is to watch it for a very low risk entry once it starts to break out of that churning cycle. And so whenever I see a stock, if I, if it's approaching my profit target that I had set originally, and I see it start to churn sideways, I will usually size out some of my trade at that point, because that usually is a, is a, spot in the chart where people are going to start taking profits and if it does break out and continue higher then you can just rebuy it you know at the end over here and if it doesn't break out and it decides that it wants to roll over and go the other direction then you've made as much as you could possibly make on it so i look for opportunities to sell when i see a stock start churning sideways right when i see a chart that looks like this this is an indication that, okay, I need to start taking some profits up here because there's a possibility that it's going to roll over. And if it doesn't roll over, then I just re-add it right there. So that's the third type of price action. Uh, another type of price action that I always take advantage of is whenever I see a spike on a chart, I always sell into it. Um, so uh, within reason, of course. So it takes a, a little bit of, I guess, experience to know how much a stock can spike safely before it's kind of exhausted. Uh, but when you look at, let me see if I can find any examples here. <clears throat> uh, oh, so here's a good one. Uh, so DRYS on uh, both Thursday and Friday was, you know, very wild. These candlesticks don't really look like much. Like this one that I've got my cursor on right here at 1350. Uh, this doesn't look like much, right? But this had a low of 926 and a high of 1041, right? So if you're trading a $30,000 account and you know you buy 500 or 1,000 shares or something like this, and it spikes $1.25 a share, you, know, you might've made yourself 500 or 1,000 bucks in literally two minutes or less. So whenever I see that kind of action, I will always take profits into that spike. Um, you know, even if, even if it, do, it the stock could go a lot further, right? When you've got a thousand bucks staring you in the face, you just take it, right? So for me, uh, determining how high these stocks can go, you know, is a lot based on experience, but whenever I see those spikes, I will always sell into it. Another one that you'll see is like, if a stock releases, a company releases PR, uh, does a press release, um, midday, wonder if I can find an example of one. Uh, so I don't think this was press release related, but if you look at something like Facebook, you know, let's assume that you're holding this in pre-market and it's just kind of drifting down. Let's say you're short, right? And it's just sort of drifting down, drifting down. And then all of a sudden it just tanks. I'm always going to take some profits, not all of them, but I'll always take profits into those drops. And the reason for it is that 99% of the time, when a stock drops quickly like this, it's going to quickly pop back up and you'll just be able to reshort it or rebuy it at the same time. Uh, sorry, at the same price. So, you know, it may, in this case, right, we dropped from 124.50 or so to 122.50, right? So the thing dropped two bucks a share in about a minute, which is obviously, you know, that's a, a fast move. And so I'll always take some profits into that type of move. So I watch for those spikes as far as determining, you know, which, which spike is too big, I guess, you know, that's where, that's where the experience comes in on stuff like DRYS. 
I know because I've traded this stock a bunch of times that you know a one dollar spike on a stock like DRYS is not really that big of a move, right? It might move a dollar or two in one single five minute candle. And so on something like this, I might be more aggressive. Um, I'll still take some profits there, right? I got a thousand shares. I might sell like 250 or, you know, a hundred or something like that, just to lock in like a hundred bucks or 200 bucks worth of profit. And, you know, then I'll hold the rest of it because I know that this stock is capable of making bigger moves than a stock like Facebook or Netflix or Google or one of these other companies that's got, you know, more shares in the float or just doesn't move as in, in the same way. You know, look at, we had an almost identical pattern here on NVIDIA on Friday. It was kind of drifting sideways, right? And it was consolidating under this 85 level. It broke above 85 and spiked to, you know, 85.70 in 10 minutes. Conversely, if we look at DRYS, we had a nearly identical pattern we were consolidating under 1050. When it broke through 1050, it went, uh, sorry, when it was consolidating under 950, when it broke through 950, it spiked to 1050 and then to 1125, right? So this thing spiked two bucks a share in the same amount of time that Nvidia took to only move, you know, a buck per share, plus DRYS is, you know, one tenth the cost of Nvidia. So, you know, there's a significant difference in the way that these two stocks move, even though the pattern is exactly the same. There's a difference in the price action and how it behaves. So, you know, learning that is obviously that takes experience. Uh, but that's another type of pattern that I look for, um, you know, just as an indication of when it's time to take some profits. Uh, fifth kind, acceleration and deceleration. Um, I actually did a talk on this for a trading conference a while ago. Uh, let me see if I can find the screenshots that I had from it. Uh, so acceleration up and deceleration up. I'm just going to open up all of these things here. Uh, excel down, excel up, decel down, decel up. Uh, grind down and grind up. So this is what I mean by acceleration, right? When you see the candlesticks getting bigger, this is always an indication for me to sell, right? I'll always sell into acceleration just because you're most likely going to get a quick reversal when a stock accelerates like this. Um, you'll also see stocks decelerate. So this is an indication that it's losing momentum, right? So this price action can be uh, you know, an indication that it's time to take some profits because the stock is losing momentum. Whereas in this case, it's becoming more momentous, which indicates that there's a lot of emotion in the trade. Uh, and that can also be a reason to escape, right? Because the more momentum that gets in on the front side of the move, the harder it's going to come back down once it finally breaks. So, you know, I'll usually sell in both of those situations. Um, and then you have the third type, right, which is sort of like a grind where all the candlesticks are just the same size and they kind of grind up, grind up, grind up. And then there will be a stall at the top and then I'll, you know, usually sell into the stall. Um, you know, or if you're shorting, obviously you can short the deceleration or you can short the acceleration on the front side of the move and then add into it once it starts to roll over. If you're buying you know, if you're a knife catcher and you like to buy stuff that's tanking, you know, then stock that's accelerating to the downside, you're going to buy into the acceleration and then add to it once it starts to bounce. You might also buy into uh, a stall, right, where it starts to kind of go sideways. Uh, Facebook was a good example of the stall the other day. Uh... <clears throat> So if we look at a one minute chart, it's a little easier to see. And actually Facebook was almost more acceleration, but so see how it was just kind of grinding downwards on the one minute chart here. And then it starts to accelerate a little bit pops and then it breaks the low and see, there's like a little stall right here where you have a lot of kind of wicky candles with wicks on the top and the bottom and it kind of is indecisive about what it wants to do and then you'll get a bounce this is 
you know, one of the biggest uh, indicators that I look for in terms of a reversal. And it works really well because uh, it gives you a low risk entry. You know, you just buy it basically as soon as it takes out sort of the high of that stall area and your stop loss is underneath the low and then just kind of let it ride. A lot of times you'll get a real nice bounce out of those and then you'll get an opportunity to potentially add to it if it does work. We have a similar pattern to what we saw on Nvidia, right? Where it's just kind of consolidating sideways again underneath a round number, 118.50. And there's your apex. So when it pops back above 118.50, we see the volume come in and then it comes back and retests it, bounces off it, and then off it goes. Um, so that actually brings me to the last type of price action, which is what I call holding. And so Facebook, this is a perfect example of it, where we see the stock break out over 118.50. And then the question that you wanna ask yourself is, is it going to hold above 118.50? Or is it gonna kind of knife back through it and just kind of fizzle out and continue drifting downwards? In this case, we see it came almost perfectly back to 118.50 and bounced off of it. This is an indication that now the trend above that level is confirmed, right? And so then all of the dips along the way, you can either buy those dips or the other thing that you can do is just use it as an indication to you know, hold on to the stock as opposed to you know taking profits on it, right? So now you just know, you know that your move is confirmed and so you can kind of uh, rest easy. You set your stop loss at break even and off it goes. And again, all of these things will work on any time frame. Just depends on your trading style. Uh, okay, so hopefully that answers your question about price action. So I use all of these things whether a stock's trending, if it's grinding, if it starts churning sideways, if it spikes up or down, or if it accelerates or decelerates, if it holds certain levels, um, you know, those are the, re the, the ways that I determine sort of what my price targets are and my profit targets, uh, my profit targets and also my stop losses, right? I don't necessarily always have a defined stop loss where, um, you know, if it goes below a certain level, I'm just instantly going to cut it off. Like I don't use stop losses in that way. What I look for is when it gets into an area where it seems like it might break the trend or where it might ruin, you know, what it's had going on. Like this, right? It's kind of holding this trend line. So my stop loss is not necessarily going to be the instant that it breaks underneath this trend line, right? It's going to be once it breaks underneath the trend line and starts to hold and confirms that it's dead. You know what I mean? It confirms that it's not going to come back above that trend line. Um, so by using the price action, determining whether the stock is accelerating, decelerating, how much momentum it has, how much volume it has, all that kind of stuff, you can really easily determine what your profit target should be, what your stop loss should be. You know, And as far as the areas to watch, I'll always watch just the significant areas on the daily chart in terms of like where the 200 day moving average is. Um, if you're a shorter term trader, you might look at like the, the 20 day or the 50 day moving average. Uh, and then look at significant levels <clears throat> in terms of the price on the daily chart. So like STEM, even if you missed that initial breakout here over 83 cents, there was still this series of highs at 95, that's a significant level. And then same thing over here, uh, 98 and 103. So a dollar is probably gonna be another significant level. You can see the support here at a dollar. See how it just kind of sat there and it would not go under a dollar for like four or five days straight. That means that $1 is a significant support level. And then once it broke underneath it, dropped down to low of 86, and then it kind of started going sideways. And so it had support at 86 or 85, and it could not seem to get above 95. So then you have 85 to 95, right, is your range for the stock. And then, you know, it broke underneath 85, drops down to a low of 70, and then it started to develop support here at 75. So when it came over, 
this 83, 84, 85 level. Next stop was 95. Next stop above that was dollar. Next stop above that was probably this level, which was really significant. You can see the support over here in like the low 130s. All these lows, 134, 133, 130, 131, 132, all those lows in the low 130s, that's your area to watch the price action very closely. Um, so when I see the stock trading in those ranges, that's what I'm looking for. And if you look at it, you can almost see it. You know, there's a high of 125 there, uh, which was this. This spike high was 123. Uh, so I'm assuming that, you know, that's sort of why it stopped there. Um, but you can see the high there, 125. And what does it do? It, it rejects it, comes back down, and bounces off of 101 or 102. And then it consolidates under 125. When it finally does break above 125, where does it go? goes to the low 130s, mid to low 130s. In this case, it was 135, um, but that was kind of the top. And so then it kind of drifted back down. So, you know, these daily levels are significant. What I'm watching for is when it approaches those levels on the intraday chart, was it accelerating into it? Uh, was it, you know, does it hit it and just get rejected immediately? Uh, does it hit it and start churning sideways? Does it hit it and uh, you know break through it and hold above it? Uh, does it hit it, reject it, and then come back up and try again and then confirm that it's not going to go through it? You know, there's a lot of different ways that you can look at it, but you know, all of those relate to the price action. So that was a pretty in-depth analysis and how I use price action to determine my stop losses, my profit targets, uh, and also you know, how it relates to these different candlestick setups. One of the other people here asked, what kind of trade setups do you look for the most? Um, how much do you do per trade? Not sure what that means. Um, I'm assuming you mean like how big of a position do I take? Uh, and that depends entirely on the chart, depends on the stock, depends on um, how much risk I wanna take, how profitable I, I, or how probable I think the setup is. Um, you know, so there's a lot of things that go into determining how big of a position I take. Um, but in terms of what types of trade setups that I make um, <clears throat> or setups that I look for the most, I really like these flag patterns like I've pointed out a bunch of times here uh, where we have you know, a stock that is consolidating into an apex and then you can just kind of buy, either buy the dips along the way. You know, If you're an, an anticipatory trader where you like to try to buy the dips and then you know add into the breakout or potentially even sell into the breakout uh, to avoid the phenomenon of like a fake breakout. Personally, I prefer, you know, more confirmation, right? So I'll usually watch a setup like DRYS till it gets into a really tight coil um, and then buy it as it comes out of it. As soon as I see all that extra volume come in, that's usually when I'm gonna buy. Uh, so that's one setup that I look for. Another type of setup that I really like is we look at like AIMT on the daily chart. Anytime I see a stock that has gone straight up with no real rest for six or seven or eight days in a row, there were a few of them last week in the biotech sector. One of them was AIMT, another one was REGN, right? It went up from like the 320s all the way to the 430s, so 110 bucks a share in just five or six days. That's a huge move. Right? That's like a 25% move on a $400 stock. It's a big, big move. So this is a stock that's got a lot of range, but even for a stock that has a lot of range, you know, 25, 30, 40% in just a few days, uh, you know, people are gonna take profits on that. If you bought this thing at 350, tell me you're not gonna sell some of it when it gets to 400 or 420. You know, you're gonna take profits and that's what you can capitalize on is those people that are taking profits. Uh, so here's another one, Halozyme Therapeutics. Uh, ticker H-A-L-O, gone parabolic here. Uh, it's not super extended. I prefer if I'm going to short something, you know, that it be really extended. And when I talk about really extended, I mean like, <clears throat> I'm gonna zoom in here. I mean like 
this kind of extended where we've gone from you know 380 to 35 bucks or 34 bucks in two weeks you know a thousand percent or a ten thousand percent move those are the stocks that i like to short um those are risky of course but they also provide probably the biggest reward uh, and they're very reliable so those are a couple of the setups that i look for uh, another setup I like actually is um, stuff that's coming off the bottom. So like Tokai Pharmaceuticals here. Um, I mentioned this one, I think, a couple of times in some of the weekly threads that we've done. Where stock has a big giant gap down like this. Uh, some kind of bad news, right, that just crushes the stock. And it goes sideways for several months and it keeps kind of tapping, tapping, tapping that same level. And then when it breaks into the gap... You're going to get a big explosive move out of it, right? So I bought this, I think, like 166 on the day that it broke out. And sold the last piece of it at 195 or 197, something like that. You know, so you make 20 or 30% on something like this in just one day. It's a very, very powerful trade setup. Uh, and it's actually really easy to find because all you have to do is go and look for any stock that has kind of taken a big dump in the last three or four months and has sort of found its bottom where it's just been sitting there flatlining for months and months and months. It's often going to be at a round number. As you can see, this one was right around $1. It was just kind of sitting there right at $1. And so that's its level. That's its sort of pseudo bottom. And then you'll start to get little hints where the stock pops up, starts flagging, and then there's a continuation move. It starts developing higher lows. And then you, know, you get a big breakout. These things often do not survive for very long so as you can see this one just went straight back down and actually ended up even lower so these things often don't survive so it's more of a day trade or a very short-term swing trade um, but i do like that type of setup and uh, it's been very very profitable for me over the years so there's another one <sighs> dun, 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 dun. all right what else we got here <clears throat> hmm would really like a video on maybe your trading style. So obviously that's going to take me like a thousand years to explain. So I can't really do that. But I can talk a little bit about the process that I use for picking individual stocks for swing trading and day trading. Uh, follow through up until selling it for a profit. What do you do when you're on the wrong side of a trade? Do you just <laughs> sit on it and wait until it comes back? No, never do that. Um, I always have a stop loss in mind. Um, I think I covered that in the last section that I was just talking about. I usually watch the price action. Um, I have a stop loss in mind based on the support and resistance on the chart. Um, and once it sort of gets near that area, then I look at the price action very closely to determine, am I actually going to sell it here? Or, you know, is it just trying to shake me out and then it's going to immediately come back up? And so that takes a lot of experience, obviously. That's why I can't really explain exactly how I do it. Um, because that's going to be, you know, it would just take way too long. Uh, and also, it's just really difficult to explain. I mean, it's just something you have to have a lot of screen time and something you need to have experience in order to do well. Um, so, no, I do not just sit on it and wait until it comes back. Um, that will never happen, right? If that, Well, sometimes it'll happen, but um, that's a waste of capital. It's a waste of capital and it's a waste of time. So, for me, I'd rather just take the loss, move on, and find something that's going to work for me. Uh, what indicators do you look at, et cetera? I'll talk about that briefly. Might be something you wouldn't want to reveal. Uh, in general, what sort of percent trailing stop loss do you use? Um, I'll talk about that. I'll talk about n not necessarily the percentage, but I'll talk about how I set my stop losses. Uh, <laughs> other topics I could think of are how to successfully day trade UVXY, Nugget, and JNUG. Um, I don't really trade ETFs that often. Uh, the leveraged ones I will trade sometimes, but you know, frankly, there's a lot of high frequency trading action that happens in these things, and it's uh, they're really tricky to trade. They're very spiky, they're very volatile, and um, you know, you you really have to be on your game in order to trade them. Frankly, I'm just not good at trading them, so I don't usually do it. And um, on that note, I don't really want to give advice on how to do it because obviously, 
my advice doesn't work since I'm not very good at it. But what I can say is that when stuff like Nugget and JNug and UVXY, when there's a big macroeconomic event like the presidential elections or something like that, usually these things will get into a trend. And so I tend to just trade these only when they're in a trend. So like Nugget, this thing was, whoops, let's shrink this back down again. You know, so this this stock or this uh, ETF is now in a, a pretty obvious downtrend over the last several days. It did pop back above it a little bit. You can see it was just sort of riding along that trend line and then flop again. So when they do this, when they get into you know, a real nice downtrend, I will sort of join the trend along the way and just short the pops or along, along the dips uh, along the way. But I don't try to anticipate these things. I usually just wait for them to get into a trend. And once it's, you know, made two or three higher lows or two or three lower highs, and it's in either an uptrend or a downtrend, you know, then I'll join in and, you know, just kind of ride, ride the wave. And then uh, when it's over, I sell. Uh, or when it breaks the trend, I sell. So that's the only real advice I can give on trading these things is wait until they have a lot of volume, wait till there's like a macroeconomic event and just confirm that they're in a solid trend by looking at the price action like we talked about before. That's definitely the easiest way, I think, to play those. Um, okay. Uh, so let's look at the stop loss question and then I'll go into my process for picking stocks. Um, I actually did, I think I did a YouTube video on that. So dig through my old YouTube videos. There might be one in there, uh, but I'll talk about it anyway. <clears throat> so what type of stop loss do you use? Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. It depends on volatility. Uh, is there a mathematical way of calculating for every stock? Yes, there is. You know, for me, that is based on the chart. So take any chart pattern. And if we look at something like PTC Therapeutics right now, the stock is currently at, uh, last price was 11.73. That's what my level two says anyway. I'm not I'm not actually sure where it is because it's after hours, but uh, looks like it's around 1173, 1174, or something like that, right? So the question I always ask myself is, where would I set my stop loss based on the chart? And remember, by the way, that I'm a day trader, so my stop losses are pretty much always gonna be based on uh, the intraday charts, not necessarily based on the daily. If you're a swing trader, then you wanna use the same technique for uh, the daily charts. Um, so the question that I ask myself is, where am I going to set my stop loss if I were to buy the stock right now at, the, at its current price? And the, that question is easily answered just by looking at the support. So if we look at sort of best fit line here, we can see that underneath this lower yellow line, this is where my stop loss is going to be. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a specific number. Um, you know, I'll just look for sort of an area where there's very clear support. It might even be a little bit tighter than that. Possibly like, I don't know, it depends on, it depends on a lot of things. But, you know, generally speaking, I'll look for an area where there's an easy way, an easy spot, you know, that's like very obvious. Uh, it might be underneath a round number. It might be underneath a very obvious support level, but it's always going to be sort of the nearest support level is like where I'm going to set my stop loss. And then what I'm going to do is determine how much I'm risking based on where the current price is, which as we saw is 11.73. And then if we draw our sort of best fit line here, stop loss, you know, maybe down to, I don't know, we want to see it probably come down underneath in order to confirm that the setup is dead. We'd want to see it come down into like this eleven twenty-five to $11 area and actually stay there. If it does that and it can't seem to reclaim this upward 
trend line, then you know the setup is probably not going to work. And so, and you have you know worst case scenario of maybe a eleven dollar stop, and then a few cents of slippage. So let's say we're risking seventy five cents to eighty cents on the trade. And now I have to ask myself the question: How high do I think this thing can go? Um, it's already at eleven seventy five. It's got some major resistance here on the daily at the bottom of this gap, which is about thirteen dollars. And so most likely if it breaks out over 11.75, it's gonna close the gap up to 13 bucks, right? So we have $1.25 of upside and potentially 75 to 80 cents of downside. To me, that is not a good reward to risk ratio. That's you know less than two to one. What I wanna see is if I'm risking 75 cents on the trade, I wanna be able to make at least 225 on it, right? So uh, plus, 11.75. I want to see this thing be able to go at least to 14 bucks, <clears throat> and it's going to hit major resistance at 13. So to me, buying this thing at 11.75 right now is not a good price to buy it. Right? I want to buy it either closer to this trend line, or I want to wait until it has more potential to go up. Right? I want to maybe wait until it hits 13 and then sets up at 13 bucks, because once it breaks over 13, you know, then it's going to be clear up to say 14.70. Or 1450, you know, the highs of this consolidation here. So once it breaks above 13, you know, then you got a dollar fifty of upside. And so if I can get it at 13 for say only 10 cents of risk or 25 cents of risk, then you've got like four to one or five to one or ten to one reward to risk, which makes a lot more sense. So even though you're paying a higher price for it, the risk is a lot lower at that point. So in determining <clears throat> Uh, you know, my stop losses, that's how I do it, right? I look at the charts and I want to try to pick sort of the area where I would set my stop loss if I were to, um, you know, sell it right now or if I were to buy it right now, where's my stop loss going to be? And then I'll use that risk to sort of ask myself the question, how high do I think this can go? And does it make sense? Can it go at least three or four times the risk? And if it can't, then I won't do the trade. So there you go. Um, okay, so next question. Uh, what's your process of picking individual stocks? Actually, hold on one second. I need to reload on the coffee. So I'll be back in 30 seconds. <clears throat> All right, so what's your process of picking individual stocks for swing trading or day trading uh, and follow through the setup, uh, follow through up until selling it for a profit? So you're basically asking me, how do I make money? Which is impossible to describe in a you know five minute answer to your question. But I will show you some of the tools that I use and I've talked about some of the patterns that I look for. So one of the tools I use is called Stock Fetcher. And <clears throat> Stockfetcher allows you to sort of write your own filters, right? So I can go, let me just create a new filter here. I can say show stocks where uh, price uh, is greater than, price greater than one and less than 10, right? If you wanna trade cheap stocks, you can say price were greater than one, less than 10. Uh, and uh, average volume over the last 30 days, is greater than 500,000, all right? So we want stuff that has a decent amount of volume um, and price above uh, the 200 day moving average. And then you hit fetch stocks and it will give you a whole list of stuff. I can debug the filter, make sure that 
all of my code works. There's a big user manual for this thing, so it shows you exactly how to write everything. Uh, shows you how to use the code and all that stuff. But it's very intuitive. It's very simple to use. Uh, it costs me eight bucks a month. So, you know, it's super cheap. Uh, it, I make tons of money off of this thing. So, you know, it's not like an expensive, you know, unattainable piece of software that, you know, an average person can't use. If you're a swing trader, you want to pay, you know, 25 bucks a quarter, you make one good trade on this thing and make yourself three or 400 bucks. It'll pay for itself for the whole year. So, it's definitely worth having. Um, I personally use it, um, <clears throat> but I've got a bunch of different scans in here. This is just a quick example of how to write one, uh, but there's all kinds of different you know, filters that you can use and all that stuff. So it's sort of like Finviz, but it's a little bit more detailed. Um, so as you can see, I've got a bunch of different filters in here. Uh, in order to find the stuff like AIMT, for example, right, where the stock gone up seven or eight days in a row and is up a lot, or Halozyme or Regeneron, one of these, you know, big biotech companies or something like that, anything that's gone up too much too quickly. Um, the filter that I have for that is just a look for anything that's up more than 50% over the last seven days. You know, it has like a couple of volume criteria and things like that. And so there you go. So like FNBC, huge bounce here from five bucks to eight bucks. So if we now look at that, it doesn't look that big on this chart. Uh, and also it was a big drop down. But you know, maybe if this thing comes all the way back up towards 10 or 1050 and still has not stopped, then you're gonna get some profit takers that bought it at five and literally doubled their money in a week or two. So you know, that's a good example of what this software can do. So this is one of the tools that I use in order to find stocks. So I've got stuff that looks for flags. I've got stuff that looks for uh, anything that has a high volatility rating. I've got stuff that looks for stocks that are closing on their highs, closing on their lows, uh, stuff that just has a lot of liquidity and a lot of range. So like liquid big rangers, right? Will give me the stuff like NVIDIA, Wells Fargo, Citigroup. Right, these are the stocks that if you've got the buying power for it, you can you know, buy 10,000 shares of it, throw a million bucks at it and make, you know, $100,000 in one day. These are the ones that big traders trade. Um, so these are nice. Um, you've got stuff that's up seven days in a row, stuff that's down seven days in a row. So these are all filters that I've written over the years. Uh, but they are, this is one of the, one of the best tools, in my opinion, for cheaply finding good stocks to trade. The only catch is you have to know sort of what you're looking for. And without experience, you're not really going to know what you're looking for. So that's one of the one of the things that sort of takes time. And the reason that it's so hard to get started in the stock market is because you need some way to sort of learn what to look for. You know, uh, so there's seven or 8,000 stocks out there. You don't want to have to search through 8,000 charts every single night. You want to know what you're looking for. Look at this STL, by the way. This is nice. Nice parabolic. It's not up a ton, but it's got that nice acceleration. And so it looks like it's getting to the point where it may be ready to pull back a little bit, uh, maybe on Monday or Tuesday. So I'm going to keep that one on my watch list. <clears throat> But yeah, so this is one of the tools that I use, stockfetcher.com. I really, really like it. Super cheap, easy to use, gives you tons of ideas, and it's very, very flexible. In my opinion, much better than Finviz because you have the ability to customize your criteria. But that's one of the tools that I use to find ideas. Uh, the other one I just mentioned, and I'm sure a lot of you guys know about this, is Finviz. And what I'll do is just go through the top gainers and the top losers. And so you can get to those right from the homepage. Just click on top gainers or top losers. And then I will arrange them all by charts. Click candle. And then I just basically look for anything that matches the pattern that I like. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not obviously going to go into detail on every single pattern that I like. But we've talked about a couple of them. EBTC getting very parabolic. TGH getting very parabolic. Curix getting very parabolic. All these stocks, <laughs> there's a lot of them actually on this list that are looking pretty extended and pretty potentially ready for a short in the near future. But this is one that I use. 
And then on the top losers, same deal. Click on charts, arrange them, candlestick type. That way it just gets rid of the default, right, is to have all these technical analysis lines on here. I just want to see the candlesticks, right? So I go to candle, get rid of all the FinViz pre-made stuff, and, uh, you know, just kind of scroll through the list. So this is one of the tools that I use. Uh, the reason that I use the top gainers and top losers is because these are the stocks that have big gains. They have lots of volume. They've got a lot of eyes on them. These are the ones that are in play, right? So if you're a swing trader or or if you're a day trader, right? These are the ones that <clears throat> you can look at it the night before and then catch it first thing the next morning for a red to green move where the stock opens up a little bit underneath where it was the day before and then pops through the previous day's high and off it goes for a secondary run. Uh, you see that a lot, especially on stuff like NVIDIA. If you look back at their earnings release in May, it had a similar type of move to what it had here. This one's a little bit bigger and a little bit more exaggerated, but you know, you gap up run all day, close on the highs, and then we don't really know what's gonna happen tomorrow, or uh, sorry, Monday, but <clears throat> back here, what happened is we gapped up, ran all day, closed right on the high at 41 bucks, and then next morning opened up at 40.67, and then came back, took out 41, and closed at 42.80. And then we went into the sort of grind upwards, all the way up to 47.50 or so. So there was potential even after that first move, you know, to get in, but you want to you want to obviously have a, a stop loss in mind, which for me would just be probably underneath the low of the day on uh, earnings day. But, you know, this would show up on the top gainers. So that's why I use the top gainers and top losers list, um, both to look for stuff that is in play and stuff that has a lot of volume, stuff that has a reason to move. Otherwise, you know, there's no volume in the stock. It's just going to sit there. So there's no reason to trade it. <coughs> uh, okay, a couple other questions here. Um, how to play using options. I do not play options. I have no idea how. Uh, I don't care. I'm good at trading stocks. That's all that matters to me. Maybe down the road when I have an account that is, you know, too big to trade the stocks that I want and I have run into problems with liquidity, then I'll start trading options or futures. But right now, uh, I don't currently trade them, so I don't uh, know how to answer that. <laughs> how to play or know when a dead cat bounce is coming. I mean, just look at the price action. When you see it settle and start to go sideways, like we saw on Facebook, on the intraday chart. All right, when you see that tight consolidation starting to coil up into a tight range, grinding back up, that's your indication, right? And that works on a daily chart, works on a five minute chart, or work on a one second chart if you have one. But that's, that's how you know. And it's obviously not always going to work. The point is that's the lowest risk place to trade it. And so that's what you want to look for is where the lowest risk place is, not necessarily where the highest probability. Now, if you can find high probability and low risk, then that's an awesome, awesome trade. Uh, last question here. Which time frame <clears throat> do you follow when day trading versus swing trading? Different time frames from different patterns. What do you look at? When you look at support and resistance using moving averages and Bollinger Bands, what time frame do you mostly look at? Uh, so for me, I'm a five minute type of trader. So I use mostly the five minute chart. What I normally do is I get my idea from the daily chart. So all of the stuff from like FinViz, Stockfetcher and so on uh, will come from the daily chart. <clears throat> and then in terms of the five minute, uh, once I have the idea from the daily chart, then I use a five minute to time my entry. On certain stocks, I will use a one minute chart, but most of the time, I use a five minute just because when I trade the one minute charts, I tend to just trade too much because it moves around a lot and it's just gonna make you think that every five seconds there's a flag on it <clears throat> or some reason to trade it. So, you know, for me, mostly the five minute chart. In terms of determining stop losses, major support and resistance levels, I'll go to a 30 minute or possibly even a 60 minute 
And the other thing that I'll use a 60 minute or a 30 minute for is if it's like a real thin stock. So you look at HNR, for example, it's tough to really see what the pattern is on a stock like this that just kind of doesn't have a lot of volume until it breaks out. It's hard to see where the pattern is because the chart's just kind of like all over the place. So I'll use a 30 minute or a 60 minute just to sort of tighten up the chart. And that way I can tell, you know, this is very clearly probably over 450 or so is going to be a breakout. HNR, this one's been in my newsletter for a couple of, uh, couple of weeks now, actually. Keeps testing that 450 level. This is a reverse split. So that 450 level used to be I think like a dollar eleven or a dollar twelve, something like that. So it reverse split four to one, which basically means that now it has one quarter of the amount of supply it had. They cut the supply by a factor of four and increase the price by a factor of four. That way, everybody has the same amount of shares, but they're four times as expensive. Gets it back up into the above one dollar range where it can stay listed on the Nasdaq or the New York Stock Exchange, um, <clears throat> but. The pattern is still the same. So now when it breaks over 450, most likely the spike is going to be a lot bigger because there's less supply thanks to the reverse split. So I've been watching this one for a while, uh, but that's one of the other things that I'll use the 60 minute or the larger time frames for. So I use all time frames really, but the main ones are probably the five minute and the daily chart. Those are the ones that I use to time my entries. Uh, okay, and then one, the only other question that you asked was <clears throat> uh, something about indicators, I believe. Yeah, what indicators do you look at? So I have a blog post actually on my blog called Cleaning the Slate, which you guys can look this up if you want. Uh, it was from, it's actually from 2013, so it's old. You'll have to probably scroll through my blog for a while to find it, but this is an indicator base or a, a blog post basically explaining that I don't use indicators. Pretty much everything is, all, all of these indicators, moving averages, Bollinger Bands, uh, RSI, stochastics, all of these indicators are calculated based on two things, price and volume. So since I already have both price and volume on the chart, I don't need 15 more lines to tell me when to buy and sell. I am a simple trader. I like to keep things easy and clean. And so I use one indicator, which is a 50 period exponential moving average. And I will use that on all my intraday charts as a guide for buying dips and also to see when the trend is broken. So as we can see here, the 15 minute, here's a 50 EMA kind of trending up here. And as you can see, the stock is getting a little bit far away from that 50 EMA. And so what I've noticed over the years of doing this is that a lot of times when you have a stock that gets really far away from the 50 EMA like that, it's gonna reject and kind of re uh, revert to the mean and pull back towards that 50 EMA. Um, so you can see it's getting really far away on the 30 minute. And if you go up to the 60 minute, it's even further away. So what I like to see is when the stock gets real far away, then I will use that as an opportunity to short. If it's, you know, taken a, a made a big morning run, then you can use it as a guide to buy dips. You can see this one was actually, I think, following it on the one minute chart. But if you look, you know, you can see it was very clearly sort of parallel to the 50 EMA. It just was a little bit above it. So you can use that trend to sort of as a guide. Um, where is, let me look at the one minute chart and see if it was following it. Yeah, so you can see it's much clearer on the one minute. It actually probably was on like the two minute where it was following it the most obviously. There you go. You know, so different types of stocks are gonna follow the EMA on different time frames, but if you can find one, you know, it's really, really obvious. So you can see every single dip came back to this two minute 50 EMA. You buy it here, you can buy it here, you can buy it here. Every single time you would have made money. 
the only time you would not have made money is if you bought it over here. And the reason for that is really just that technical analysis only works so many times, right? You have a bounce, bounce, bounce. At some point, it's going to fail. And usually three, four tries is what causes it to fail. So, you know, after the third or fourth attempt, I won't really touch it, but there you go. So the one that I use uh, is the 50 EMA, and then I use the 200-day moving average on the daily chart. Uh, Bollinger Band, Stochastics, RSI, VWAP, all that stuff, don't use it, don't care. Uh, it's not useful for me. Um, price action, volume, price, 50 EMA, 200-day moving average. Those are the ones that I use. <clears throat> oh, let's see here. Mm -hmm. So I answered this question from Big Slim V Dub here. How do you short promoted penny stocks that you get newsletters for? That's a really, really tough issue because it's a lot more than knowing that it's a short, right? You've got to know. You look at something like BTUUQ. We all know that a stock that's gone from $1.80 to $19 in six days or seven days, however long this was, we all know it's going to come back. Right? We all know it's going to tank. The problem is finding shares to short. you got to have a broker that has shares to short. Most of the brokers that are going to have stuff like this available to short, they're going to have $50,000, $100,000, $500,000 minimums. So you know the average person is not going to be serious enough about trading to really want to trade those. Um, the other issue is it's expensive, and the, the main issue is that it's risky. Um, you know, shorting these penny stocks, <laughs> this thing was up four or five hundred percent when it was a six bucks, and it still continued up to almost 20. So you never know how high these things are going to go. So getting involved in something like this is just really, really risky. Um, you should only do it if you've been trading for a long time. And so that's why I said, you know, there's a lot more to this than just knowing that it's a short. Um, <clears throat> it's a game that most people on this subreddit are probably not going to be interested in playing just because, you know, maybe you're a newer trader or you're just kind of getting started or you don't have a huge account. Um, it's just really risky. It's really expensive. Um, you're going to have to have a good relationship with a good broker in order to get the shares to borrow and all that kind of stuff. Um, the other problem is uh, the other reason that I'm you know, not really giving a lot of detail on this is just because 95% of the people that, you know, are on this subreddit are not going to have that kind of broker. And if you guys do have that kind of broker, you don't need my advice. You already probably know more than I do. You already know what you're doing. So, you know, that's all I can really say about it. You know, these penny stocks, this BTU UQ wasn't really a pump. Now, that was just a, a parabolic run, but you know, sometimes you'll get newsletters and stuff like that, but uh, I don't personally trade that way. Um, I love shorting. I short a lot, but, you know, not OTC, usually not penny stocks unless it's a listed company. Um, you know, and I wouldn't recommend that anybody do it unless they really know what they're doing. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Hopefully this video doesn't turn out too long because it's going to take me like four hours to upload it. <clears throat> uh, let's see here. Question here would be, what's a simple strategy that a part-time trader in Robinhood can use? Don't expect any big profits, but I'd be happy enough to predict stock movements for days or week and then analyze what I got right and wrong. Is there a set of technical analysis indicators you consistently use? Um, so yeah, I mean, the one, one that I mentioned is a 50 EMA. You could use that on like a 60 minute time frame maybe and just buy dips whenever a stock that's in a nice trend and has a lot of volume like NVIDIA comes back towards that 50 EMA. You know, just buy the dip and, you know, sell it in a few days. <clears throat> the other thing that you can do is look for those flag patterns on daily charts. You could look for stocks that have sort of done the opposite of what STL did here where we have you can't short on robin hood so that's one issue but you can find stocks that have done the same thing as stl or just you know invert this chart and make this red right where the stock is just tanked and then look for that sort of settling at the bottom right where you have 
deceleration or acceleration down and then you start to see it settle whoops all right so it starts to slow down the candlesticks start to get smaller and then maybe you get a green candle uh, what was that one that we just looked at fnbc this is a great example see how this thing just like tanked from 1150 down to like five bucks and then it started to kind of go sideways and you see how the candlesticks get really really tight really really small range if you look at like a 60 minute chart you can see it started to find its bottom here around five bucks and it started to coil up put in slightly higher lows and then broke out above a round number 550 there you go you know this is a great great type of trade for a swing trader you're basically just looking for that settling for it to put in its bottom and then start to make higher lows and then off it goes right you could have bought this at 550 set your stop loss underneath five bucks and you know it runs over the next four or five days up to eight so great great example i do this stuff all the time i actually have an entire subreddit the um 1k robin hood project which is exactly what I've done with it. Um, I open this account with $1,000 and I basically just look for short-term swing trades and you know, I buy a couple thousand shares, make a couple hundred bucks and then sell it. And it works really, really well. This account's up 120% since I opened it. So you know, not a huge amount of money obviously because it was just a $1,000 account. But you know, if you're just getting started, it's a great way to take a thousand bucks and turn it into 2,000 or 3,000 and then you know maybe you can open up a real account with a real broker and then you can start making some real trades um so hopefully that helps answer the question um also you know use things like stock fetcher use finviz the top gainers and top losers list to find stocks that are in play um, those will always have residual momentum after they make big moves um do you manually pick these stocks? Do you have some helpful screener or code that picks a few that you can scrutinize? Yeah, so stock fetcher, Finviz. Um, I've got a couple of other ones too, but those are the main ones that I use. Um, and then, uh, you know, Twitter, stock twits, like anything that's trending on Twitter or stock twits, um, you know, they're usually not gonna be like good long-term investments, but they'll be good stocks for trading that'll run up for five or six days and then fall off the face of the earth again. Um... What about value investing and intrinsic value? <laughs> yeah, so I'm not a I'm not a value investor. Um, I I'm not an investor at all, really. I have a, a couple of long term accounts, uh, old 401ks from previous jobs and stuff like that. But frankly, I don't even look at them. You know, I rebalance like once every six or eight months, and you know, move from small cap into mid cap or mid cap into large cap or value into growth or something like that. But I don't really like scrutinize the companies that are in them because that stuff is for my retirement, right? That's the money that I don't touch. That's just for me later on in case I go broke <laughs> trying to day trade um, and need a nest egg, you know? So I don't do any real value investing. The only stuff that I will do in terms of fundamentals is I read a lot of SEC filings. So if we go to sec.gov, click on company filings, and there's actually a another YouTube video on the on this on my channel called How to Anal, uh, Analyze an Annual Report. Um, and you know, put in any company. I don't remember. We'll just I don't know what's what is this STL that we were looking at? I don't know anything about this company. Sterling Bancorp. So STL. So put it in there. Filing type 10 hyphen will give you all the 10 Qs, which are the quarterly earnings reports. So there's three of those. And then there's gonna be the fourth quarter, which is a 10K, which is an annual report. And so one of the things that I do if I'm going to make a long-term investment is I always read the annual report. And what you do is just click on documents and then click on the first link here. This is the actual 10K. You can see type 10K. All these other ones, these are exhibits, which are basically just like attachments of like links to websites and press releases and you know even stuff like graphics, logos, and things like that. Uh, and then at the bottom, there's a text file, which has the whole SEC filing in sort of a standardized text format, and that's used for algorithmic trading. Um, companies that will 
write algorithms to read the SEC filings. So, what is this thing doing? Must be a big filing. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. So, obviously, you're going to want an algorithm <laughs> to go through this. But, if you don't have an algorithm, read the normal one. So there's a video, like I said, on my channel about how to analyze these things. It's actually a little bit old. It was one of the first YouTube videos that I did. So excuse me if I say um and uh a lot, but I think the content was fairly good. What I like to do is just analyze the risk factors. I like to know what the, what the business is, what they do. I like to know what their major risk factors are. I want to know legal proceedings, if they have any like outstanding lawsuits or anything like that. And then, uh, <clears throat> the management's discussion of financial condition and results of operations. I just want to know, are they in trouble, right? Are they, do they mention that there's uh, a question of them being able to continue as a going concern, for example, meaning they may be facing bankruptcy or something along those lines. So I look for those types of red flags. All that stuff is detailed in the other video. Uh, but you know, that's one of the things that I'll do. Business, risk factors, legal proceedings. I read the management discussion of analysis, the MD&A. Um, and then uh, at the end of these annual reports, you have like directors, exec officers, and corporate governance, right? So you can read about the management, uh, who it is, what their qualifications are, how much money they make, what their connections are with other companies, all that kind of stuff is in here. So you know, I will scrutinize a company's annual report if I want to make a long-term investment in it. And then I'll follow up with just looking at the financial data, see if they're profitable, uh, see if there's any major red flags like ballooning accounts receivable or anything along those lines. And that stuff's all stuff that you can look up online or through Investopedia, Wikipedia, Google. But I am not a investor, I'm a trader. So 90% of the time I'm not looking <clears throat> at the fundamentals as a reason to make the trade. I use it as a, a supplement or a complement to the chart. Okay. And getting close to the end here. I'm not sure if you use study with your studies with your charts. Yes, we talked about that. 50 EMA, 200 day moving average. <laughs> like MACD and slow stochastics. <laughs> Yeah, so I gave you my thoughts there, Jerry Mills, on my the, on the value of studies with technical analysis. I personally think um, they give you false hope, right? There's what matters is price and volume, and price action. So I don't need extra lines or indicators to tell me when to buy and sell. Uh, and it looks like that is it. So I wonder how long we are at here. <clears throat> Don't think there's even a way for me to tell. So let's leave it at that. Hopefully I got to everybody's questions. If you did have anything that wasn't in here and you want it answered, post it in the comments section on the YouTube video once it's uploaded. Um, also, I'll put in, like I usually do, a link to my newsletter sign up, which I run a free newsletter that I send out every Sunday and Wednesday just with some ideas to trade. And I'll post a link to my blog, which is also free and a bunch of other stuff that you know, you can kind of browse around through my website and all that. Um, but thanks for all the questions. Hopefully this was helpful. And let me know if you have any others. Thanks. Peace, guys.